And we went through, it's actually very useful uh, to see our historical survey on the wall. And we saw that we start off with the period of, uh, of course the Omer period is from the Chumash, way back to the times of Moshe, right? It's Har Sinai. And then we, next time we, measure, we, we mentioned Omer was with the students of Rabbi Akiva in the period, the green period of our sages. And then we said that there is, uh, um, unfortunately, pogroms in the, the Crusader times, the times of the Rishonim, and then also pogroms in Ukraine in the times of the Achronim. So throughout all the different uh, uh, periods of Jewish history, unfortunately, this period, this time of year has been associated with, with trials and tribulations. So that built on top of the built-in sort of trepidation we've mentioned that the agricultural farmer would have that the wheat should, should reach its final status uh, in good health. Yes? Wow, that's interesting. I never thought that uh, was connected. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. They tried the same thing right, the same right. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It is. Uh, I'm wondering. That was before uh, Har Sinai. Yeah. It was before Har Sinai. Right. It seems that it seems that way. Yeah. Like right away, they went out of Egypt. Right after, at the end of Parsha B'Shalach, after they came through the Red Sea. Seems like that the, there was a, a war with Amalek. That's right. Interesting. Yafe. Well, let's talk about halacha. Let's talk about halacha. Uh, we're on page 51. There are many customs regarding the morning period begin when the morning period begins and ends. Four primary minhagim. Okay. Moshe, you read for us. Sure. Page 51, number one. The duration of the morning period, there are many customs regarding when the morning period begins and ends. We will mention the four primary ones. Number one, the custom of mourning applies to the entire Omer period. This custom is based on the version of the Gemara that appears in our texts, uh, Yevamot 62b, which states that uh, Rabbi Akiva's students died to be Pesach and Shavuot. Thus, one should follow the customs of mourning throughout that period. Number two, the morning period continues until Lagba Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer. This custom is based on the local tradition that Rabbi Akiva's students stopped dying in Lagba Omer. Number three, the customs of mourning apply until the 34th day of the Omer. This is based on Sephardic tradition, according to which the text of the Gemara reads, Rabbi Akiva's students died until Pros Ha Artseret. Since Pros means half, and that Sarah refers to Shavuot, this means that they died until half a month before Shavuot. When we subtract 15 days from the 49 days of the Omer, we are left with 34 days during which Rabbi Akita's students died, during which we observe customs of mourning. Number four, we observe 33 continuous days of mourning. This custom is based on the tradition that Rabbi Akita's students died on every non festive day of the Omer period, which adds up to 33 days. Consequently, we must observe customs of mourning for 33 straight days, whether this period coincides with the beginning or the end of the Omer period. Okay, so, got that? Four customs. The whole thing? Only uh, up until Lag Bomer, I guess you could say the first 33 days. Um, or um, 33 plus 1 until the 40, 34th day. Most Sephardim practice that, which is a little bit difficult because 33rd day is a party. We're going to talk about the party. I'm like, Bomer, how can you have a party if you're still having morning customs until the 34th? But this is quite common, uh, Lidan. And the last period is that we have to have 33 somewhere. And this is what we're going to get into, what we mentioned yesterday, that the Ashkenazi custom was to do the 33 days at the end the latter 33 days, because that fit, fit in better with the historical commemorations of the, the pogroms in their communities. And that's uh, the idea of starting in Rosh Chodesh, right? Uh, Rosh Chodesh Iyar, 
Pesach, when do we start counting? The 16th of Nisan, right? And so the way of 14 days, we get to the first of Iyar. First of Iyar, uh, till the end, we have 30 days of Iyar, and then six days of Sivan until, until Shavuot. But there's three days before Shavuot, we're going to talk about them, that are called Shloshet Yimei which are not count. So what are we left with? If you take off those three days, we're left with 33. So you can start from Rosh Chodesh Iyar and count 33 days till three days before Shavuot. And that is the custom in many Ashkenazi communities. And that's what actually somebody came to me the other day, crying. He was so upset. He was so embarrassed that he confessed to the rabbi. He said, I'm so embarrassed. I forgot. This was about a week ago, whatever it was. Uh, and he said, I, I, I got a haircut. He's a ger, a very, uh, you know, uh, sincere man, and he just said, I forgot. I just like, you know, I went into the barber and I got a haircut. And he was feeling so bad. So I tried to calm him down and said, many, many reasons why you shouldn't feel so bad. First of all, the whole thing is, it's a, it's a custom of mourning. It's not like you violated any law from the Torah or from the rabbis. It's not the right or the rabbanan, that's right. Secondly, <laughs> This was a few days before Rosh Chodesh. Oh. And I said to him, this year, you can commemorate the 33 days starting from Rosh Chodesh till the, till the end, until three days before Shavuot, like the Ashkenazi communities, uh, instead of the first 33 days, which is the default, perhaps, for most people uh, uh, follow. Or we're going to see that the Kabbalists have the whole thing, all 49 days. But uh, that's, a, that's a whole other thing. Anyways, let's see what the, what the practice is. Um, we have... Mm-hmm. Some, some, some Ashkenazi groups. Not all, not all. That's right. That's right. And there's a, f- a fascinating tshuva. <laughs> Right, right. So you get to choose. It's so interesting. Usually it's your fa- you have a family tradition or a community tradition. And what happens if you are invited to a wedding after Lagba Omer? Let's say the fellow getting married is Fardi. And he did 33, even 34 days, okay? 35th day decides to have a wedding. So... Uh, but you're following the Ashkenazi tradition of going from Rosh Chodesh, Iyar, till the end. They're almost to the end, right? So Rabbi Moshe Feinstein has a tshuva and many other rabbis too. And they say, it's fine, go. You're allowed to go to a wedding because you're not really violating your custom. You're, he's not to blame. He's doing, he's doing everything right. And to, not to mar his simcha, not to mar his joy, you're allowed to go and participate. Uh, even and dance and sing, even dance and sing. We're going to see. He talks about it here. But it's a fascinating thing where we have two groups within the Jewish people with different practices. Of course, it's no strange phenomenon to us. We live here with Sephardim and Ashkenazim and, and Yemenites and every different kind of Jew. So this is not a, a new thing. But uh, within Ashkenazim that you have two groups, that's what's unique. Is uh, that uh, there's a lot of splinters. Uh, all right, let's see what the what the practice is. Okay, Dave, will you read uh, page fifty three, number three? Uh, yes. Yeah. The customs of morning begin on the first day of the Omer and last until the morning of the thirty fourth. This is based on the tradition that, according to the Gemara, Rabbi Akiva students died until Ros Ha'atzel, meaning 15 days before Shavuot. This implies that we must continue mourning until the 34th day of the Omer. However, as with the law of mourning during Shiva, seven-day mourning period for Ha'atzel, a small part of the day is considered like a whole day. Therefore, just as a mourner may terminate his shiva period, period after starting to mourn for only a short time at the beginning of the seventh day, since he has effectively completed that day, the same applies to the mourn of the Omer periods. One need not wait until the end of the 34th day. Rather, all customs of mourning cease to apply a few moments after daybreak on the morning of the 34th, because a small part of that day is considered like the whole day. 
Despite this, one may sing, play music, and dance on land over in honor of the anniversary of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's death. However, the, the other customs of mourning remain binding. Thus, according to this practice, one may not get married or cut one's hair on La Roma, and when the day ends, one may not play music or dance on the night of the 34th. When the morning of the 34th comes, however, all practices of mourning cease to apply. Those who follow Alizan's customs act stringently and refrain from cutting their hair until El Shavuot. And some Sephardic communities, like those in Turkey and Egypt, have all and all customs of mourning on La Roma. Even though most Sephardi and Israel today do not follow this practice, if there is a great need to be lenient on La Roma on the night of the 24, one should consult with the Proroscope. Right, often the question becomes, uh, you know, it's very difficult, this custom of not to get married. It's springtime, it's summertime, that's when most people get married. Marriages in the winter, of course, are allowed, and it's a good thing to get married, uh, not, not too often, but, but uh, whenever, whenever you can, first chance you can. Um, not, not as often as you can, right, right. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, and there's a whole industry of weddings. It affects everybody. It affects the bands and the photographers and the hairdressers and, the, 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 of course, the, the wedding halls. They don't have any business for 33 days. So how do we work that? So unfortunately... Uh, many, you know, reg marriage registrars in this country, there's many. Yeah, every little local rab rabbinut, ra rabbinic council, has the ability to register their citizens, their residents of that area, for marriage. And they each have their own opinion on this. Some people say, they say, ask you, are you Sephardi or Ashkenazi? If you're Sephardi, will they allow you to get married on Lagbar? No, only on Lamed Dalid, on the 34th day. But other people say, no, ah, you're from Turkey, you're from Egypt, ah, you can get married on Lag Bomer. And so if you're Ashkenazi, then you're allowed to get married on Lag Bomer. We're going to see the Ashkenazi custom in just a minute. But some they say, sorry, no weddings for the entire 49 days. That's, that's a big stringency. Even if you're Ashkenazi, it's Friday, I don't care. We're going to follow the custom just to be safe. You're being safe, but you're really being lenient about, about uh, getting married. It's such a big mitzvah to get married. And so oftentimes you have to pick and choose where to register your marriage because uh, you should find out ahead of time. Are they going to be more flexible with allowing you to get married before Lag Bomer, on Lag Bomer? And, and, uh, so if there is like a year that I know like friends are getting married, yeah. so I can play with them. Like uh, this year, I will be the custom No, no, you have to. You have to be the Ashkenazi. I will be the party. I think you know the answer to that question. Yes, Moshe. Yeah. Because I, like, I thought about this last night. Um, in in uh, like throughout the world, this is peak wedding season. And so when you get springtime for sure. The end of spring, the beginning of summer. This is what it's very difficult. Right. Exactly. So it's, 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 it, it, you know, some Jews, you know, will, will get married quite quickly, you know, propose on the marriage in two months, but others, you know, like, they plan out the wedding for a little right, while, right. they might hold off, so, and, 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 like, does this often, like, become a problem? It does, it does, people know, they either get, uh, that's why there's lots of weddings right before Pesach, and then after Lag Bomer, most, in most cases, they allow you to get married, yeah, but... And if someone has, uh, like, he, 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 for example, I will finish the gear and and then I need to marry my wife right away next day. That's right. After, Same after, day, yeah. yeah. After the Nikla. That's right. Then it's okay? So that's a good question. So are you going to become Sephardi or Ashkenazi? <laughs> They're going to... For the, for the sake of uh, getting... I'm Ashkenazi. I was Right. So up until Rosh Chodesh, it would have been fine. That, you know, they could say, oh, Ashkenazi, you'll practice from Rosh Chodesh until the end. You stepped in a few minutes late, but we said there is an Ashkenazi uh, custom to, to practice this, these customs of mourning in the latter 33 days, the later ones. Um, but if you're in between Rosh Chodesh and Lag Bomer, like we are now, this, this what's it, uh, two weeks, two week, 18 days really, 18 days in between, you... This is the period where, almost according to everybody, you're not allowed to get married. So what would the rabbinut do if you do a giur and you have to marry your wife right away? Maybe they wouldn't do a giur. 
Hmm. So you, you are on a married, on a married couple. That's possible, yeah. but that's really yeah. stringent. Yeah. It's really yeah. stringent. Yeah. I would say that this would override the, the usual custom of not getting married because, uh, you know, why put off a giur and, and put off the mitzvah of getting married? Fine, this is a unique case, but it's a very interesting question. Uh, I haven't seen any discussion of it. Also, yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, don't give them any ideas, right? Shh, don't think. Uh, the system, I mean, my, my Rav Michael was telling me a Torah, he heard of some woman that was supposed to go to the mikvah. She's all finished with her giyur and she's waiting for the date and she was supposed to go. And then they called, her, sorry, no, pushed off. For bureaucratic reasons, I said, you know, I've, I've become jaded. I've seen this too much. But he was shocked. How can you do that? This person's waiting to become Jewish. And you just push them off. It's a, you can't do that. Unfortunately, things happen. Whenever you get the, you know, uh, a government involved, with a, and there's a bureaucracy, and there's a system, uh, not everything uh, is as simple as we would like it to be. So uh, that's a fascinating question. I'll have to think about it. I'll look it up and see if I can find any discussion yeah, of that. Not my case, but I just my Why not? When are you going to be finished? Maybe soon. So. Maybe before uh, next week. Who knows? You never know. That's the thing. You never know. Yes, Micha. So, is it the so, so like, what I'm saying, like, if you're already married, yeah, you can live with your wife. Yeah, not not if you're. <laughs> you can wait. Yeah, you can wait. Yeah, wait, can wait. No, 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 because you're not allowed to sleep together. You can't live together with your wife. Mm. Once once you're Jewish, you can only live with your wife when you're married to her. Yeah, of course. Right. Yes. Okay. All right, that's that's this Friday process. Let's go ahead with the Ashkenazi process. Question, question, yeah. It doesn't talk about human actions in their customs. Uh, let's see, maybe in the uh, continuation. I don't see what their custom is. You're right. I don't see anything about it. Um, I'm not sure. But they can follow the Rambam, right? The Yishtem the, the Amnus. Uh, correct. Um, anyways, let's go on, and uh, we'll leave that as a question mark as well. Yeah. Uh, number four. Um, Renan, will you read for us? Number four, Ashkenazic press? Correct. Ashkenazic press. Prevalent custom among Ashkenazi Israel today is to have the Israel today. Amalgamates, that means put together. Puts together several traditions, yeah. Uh, several traditions. Most customs of morning last until late long work, while some continue after after work. This is based on the tradition that uh, although the plague ended uh, on late Balmer, students who fell ill before didn't die between the third and fourth day of the Omer and Shavuot. Therefore, Ashkenazi. <coughs> Do not cut their hair, get married, play music, or dance until a bomber. After four, however, they refrain only from weddings in uh, large celebrations. Another reason for this custom is that during the crusades and the Nitzkim massacres, mm -hmm. huh? yeah, yeah, yes, of uh, these dates. Tens of thousands of Ashkenazi Jews were killed. Since this murder occurred mainly during the later part of the Omer period, Ashkenazi women to refrain from large celebration during this period. From Rosh Hashanah to Ban, however, it's the customary to permit weddings because of the Jewish Shavuot, which we already begin to experience from the beginning of the month, cancels the morning. So, rule leniently. And uh, allow one to take care of my bomber and on, and to avoid only occasional large celebrations and to show forth. In the note below, you mentioned another system that was very widespread in Germany. That's what I mentioned that we start on Shodesh only and go to the end. That's the custom I was telling you. Go ahead. On the day of the bomber <coughs> itself, it's permitted to get married and take haircuts. There is a dispute, however, regarding the night. Some say that weddings and haircuts are permitted at night as well, because the entirety of La Palmer is joyous. Joyous? Joyous. Others maintain that the one is required to observe 
33 plus a consecutive day of mourning. So it's permissible to get married and get haircut only after mourning has arrived and we can apply the rule. Part of the day is considered like a whole day. It's customary to act stringently, but one may follow those rules, but those who grow leniently if necessary. A part of all custom is permissible to celebrate with music and dancing on the night of Bulla. Right, so that's the little detail of can you get married on the eve of Lagwa Omer? Erev Lag Bomer. Well, Erev would mean the day before, so the, the eve of Leil Lag Bomer is how we usually say it. Okay, so we have different, um, different customs. Let me just clarify. I'll do this on the board so that you can. Need to be 33 consecutive days. According to some customs, according to some August. customs, uh, yeah, not uh, so. Okay. So when we start with the uh, Nissan, and we're going to do a timeline here. What happens on the 15th of Nissan? Pesach. 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 Very good. Actually, Chagam Matzot. Chagam Matzot. The 14th yeah, is the. 14th. Okay. Ah. What happens on the 16th of Nissan? First of July. That's the uh, actually when they brought the Omer sacrifice. The Omer, the barley sacrifice. 16th. So we go on. <laughs> sorry? No, 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 sorry. I, I, I said lack of Omer. It's over. <laughs> right, 16th. So it's one. It's Omer number one. Okay, we go on, and then 15 days later, 40 days later, we have ER. Right, so the first of ER. Um, and then we have. Uh, by the way, we haven't mentioned. What happens on Hey ER, fifth of ER, regarding the Omer? But we're going to get to that. We did discuss it a little bit when Yamat Smoke was here. Anyways, the next thing is we go keep going until the 18th of ER. That's when it's Lag Ba Omer, 30th day of the Omer. Okay, and then we have another few days until we get to Sivan. Okay, Sivan number one is uh, Rosh Chodesh, and then we have another uh, uh, few days until the 6th of Sivan, and that is Shavuot. Now I mentioned to you that the three days before Shavuot are called, they're, they're, they're almost like a festive day. Right? We're going to talk about them, that uh, it says in, in Shmot, that uh, the Jewish people had to prepare for the revelation at Sinai. Mm, and Moshe said, get ready for three days. Get ready for three days. So the bait, two days, three days. And we practice that those three days are, are special. So what we're left with is one, two, three. So we have three days here, uh, which um, are they uh, festive? Well, they're not actually part of the three days before Shavuot, but we have Rosh Chodesh itself. It's a special day. And then there's these two days, so it's sort of like sandwiched. As a matter of fact, Shavuot, the custom is that uh, in the temple times, well, it's, only, it's the only festival that's only one day. Right? Pesach's a whole week, yeah. Shavuot, uh, Sukkot is a whole week, so it's only one day. And so they had trouble getting all the sacrifices done on the one day. And so there's the six days after Shavuot, the entire week of Shavuot, in the temple, they were, they, they were still finishing off the sacrifices. Of the Shavuot. So till today, we don't say Tachnun in those days. Until the 14th. Until the 14th. Until the, 14th. Until the, 14th. Uh, the 7th through the 14th, uh, we, we don't say Tachnun. So that's, so basically, if we go for this entire period, half a week until the 14th, is festive, this, this entire period. And so some people, these three days in between, they say, okay, they should also be festive. And Although, again, we said for starting the 33 days here, on Rosh Chodesh Iyar, you need those three days to get the full mm -hmm. 33, right? This is the other option. You either go from the beginning, from the first of the Omer until the 33rd of the Omer, or from Rosh Chodesh until the end, this is another way of getting 33 days. Now that's assuming that they have to be consecutive. Um, the problem, of course, is the 33rd day itself. Is that included? Uh, because we have uh, parties 
Lagba Omer, we celebrate, we'll talk about Lagba Omer and what, what its meaning is and why we commemorate with, with uh, you know, bonfires and, and music and dancing. And, but according to the many customs, you're allowed to celebrate, but you still shouldn't cut your hair. We said this Friday, you only cut your hair on the 34th. And according to the Ashkenazim, you are 33rd, you can party, but you shouldn't get married. Getting married, you should wait until, well, at least not the eve of 33rd, maybe at the, in the daytime of the 33rd, you're allowed to, but the night of the 34th is the first time you get married. My brother, is the Shem, it's still a secret, don't tell anybody. My brother has a son who's getting engaged, Baruch Hashem, and he's gonna have a party, an engagement party, surprise, on the, the night of the 34th. The day after Lag Bomer. And don't tell anybody. Just to be, and don't tell anybody it's a secret. So we don't know yet that it's happening. There's already a date for the wedding, but it's okay. <laughs> it, he's, he's waiting because his brother is also getting married. He doesn't want to, you know, step on his toes. It's okay, they're young. The, but anyway, so the, uh, the, the night after Lag Bomer is already the 34th. So according to the Ashkenazi custom, you're totally done. You can even get married on the night of the, thir- the 34th. Uh, the Eve, right? The, the, the uh, Lail 34. Because uh, the 33rd day is totally finished, and you finish your 33 days. And that's many Ashkenazim practice the first 33. The night of the 33 is finished, or even the morning of the 33rd is good enough. We said, Mikzat Hayom Kechulo, part of the day is like the whole thing. And so by the, the once the 33 day comes, you can. You can uh, cut your hair, and you can get married, and uh, all those kind of things. Okay, is that, I hope this chart clarifies things. I'll take questions, yeah, David. Yeah. So that would mean that people who start fasting the morning from uh, the first to the uh, to the third of Sivan, would they say Tanhamun on those two days? No. No, no, still, okay. still, you don't say Tachnun. And nobody says Tachnun from Rosh Chodesh till the 14th. Regardless of whether or not you're practicing those, some practices of mourning, like the haircuts and the, the weddings. And so, yeah. so I can get a haircut starting on on Lagomer. You're Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi. Okay. And I can continue. I couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> but. Okay, Rebbe. Um, <laughs> so my question really is, I can I can get a haircut starting on Lagomer. And continuing on for the rest of the Oymer and getting her head. Yes? Correct, correct, okay. correct. That's, that's the, the common Ashkenazi customs. As we said, there's some, some Ashkenazi don't, they say you can get a haircut and uh, maybe even listen to music, but you shouldn't have a wedding until the total Shavuot or, or three days before Shavuot. Oh, you know what? Okay, six days before I don't, Shavuot. I don't, we'll be think, I don't think I'm going to have that problem. Okay. At least this year. At least this year. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have a question, maybe it's very basic to this practice, but I mean, what's so specific, what's so big about the hair? The hair cutting? Hair We're going to talk about it. We're yeah. going to talk about it because we have to talk about hair cutting versus shaving, not necessarily the same halacha. We'll talk about it in just a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you need to be consecutive, like it's impossible to do more. Because? Because you have Yom HaTzmaut right. in the middle of the two sets. Of That's the right. Day. Either way, right here in the middle is Yom HaTzmaut. Right. Also, if you are Ashkenazi, you have uh, Omer. That's right. That's right. So, so it's... Okay. So uh, it's complicated. Some people, uh, some Sephardi, we said according to the Rizal's custom, the entire... The entire Omer, until Shavuot, we don't cut our hair until the day before Shavuot, the end of the 49 days. And that means even though they're going to be celebrating on, on, on Lag Bomer, they're going to be dancing. So we see that not all the customs go together. Uh, David asked, well, what about does this work with, with Tachanun? No, each one has its own sort of time clock and its own system of what overrides what. So it's many great rabbis. They don't shave uh, for the entire 49 days. and uh, But they will celebrate on Lag Bomer with music. And if they're celebrating on Lag Bomer with music, then they'll celebrate on Yom Atzmut, if they, if they uh, believe you should. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're going to shave their, their, their beards or their hair. On the other hand, we have some, most, I'd say most rabbis, they don't do the entire 49 days. At least when it comes to haircutting. 
They do the first 33, the most common is the first 33 days, and then you cut your hair on the 33rd day, it's fine, you get your hair cut on Lag Bomer. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's a custom to uh, not cut children's hair until they're three years old. You did that? Yeah, me too. Me too. I was adorable. <laughs> you still are, Moshe. You still are adorable. Hmm. Okay. For the first haircut after three years, right? People make a big deal of it. Some people make a big deal of it, and they go on Lagba Omer specifically, even if the child is three years old a month before, or even a month later. It's not like a halacha that you have to be so careful about. But some people, they, they specifically want the haircut to be done on Lag Ba'omer in Midron. By Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's kever. We'll talk about the association of Lag Ba'omer to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in just a few I, I moments. Know, I know in Yiddish it's called the Ramsher. What's it called in the Hebrew? Is that a term? In Yiddish, it's, it's, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a term called Chalake. Chalake or upsharing. Upsharing is, is, is a haircut in, in Yiddish. Chalaka, I don't know what language it is, but it's also, I think, a, 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 maybe it's Hungarian or something. I don't know. But there's, the, uh, otherwise, I don't know what it's called. Um, I don't know what it's called. Are there names for it in other uh, is there, traditions? Is there for Hebrew? Uh, Chalaka is, is usually used. I don't know why, but okay. So the, that's the three. That's the three. Uh, that lagbomer. So lagbomer is associated with hair cutting. Because according to everybody, you're allowed to cut your hair on like Bomer, except for those Kabbalists who go for the full 49 days. Yes, another question, yeah. Lag. So lag is Lamed Gimel. Lamed Gimel is 33. Ah. Lamed is 30. Gimel mm-hmm. is 3. So it's uh, using the gematria. Oh, so the like 33rd Tisha day of the Omer, it's like, oh, it's like Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'av. Tisha means 9, nine. the 9th of Av. The word Tisha means 9. Here, the word lag, it doesn't mean anything. It's an acronym. I have a gematria of, of uh, 33. Okay? Ba'omer, in the Omer, in the count, during the count of the Omer. It's the 33rd day. Ba'omer, in the Omer period. And, it, it, and when, when, from which time we, we, we make the lag ba'omer as a... What, uh, when was it? When? Uh, its earliest when? origin of, of celebrating. Yeah. We're going to talk about that soon. That's coming up. Exactly. That's the next issue. Where, where does this whole idea of Lag Bomer come from? That's a good question. Okay. Um, we already saw a little bit, Amos. We already saw a little bit that, that um, there's one version of the Talmud which says. The students of Rabbi Akiva died from Pesach until Pros HaAtzeret. Pros is half. It's a half a month before Atzeret. If you work out uh, 30 days between uh, Shavuot backwards, um, it comes out to the third of Iyar, right? The, the sixth of Sivan comes back to the sixth of Iyar. And then two weeks later is the 18th of ER, which is Lag Bomer. So that's, or the 34th day of the Omer. And so it's sort of built in way back to the Gemara if we use that calculation of that Girsa, that version of the Gemara, which says half of, till half of Shavuot. Half of Shavuot meaning two weeks before Shavuot. Two week, this is exactly two weeks before Shavuot. Mm-hmm. So there's still no associations with Rabbi Shimon Baruchai. There's still no hair cuttings. Yeah. But the idea that the students stopped, stopped dying, stopped they stopped dying during this period, two weeks before, then that's, uh, that's uh, the earliest uh, mention that we could have in the Talmud of this being uh, a day which should be marked because it's the end of the period where the students uh, were dying, okay? So that's something to celebrate for sure, okay? All right, let's continue. And uh, we're gonna skip over the marriages. We talked about weddings and engagements. We said how it's, it's quite some fancy footwork. There's so many different customs and so many ways to work it. 
Um, I believe that it's such a big mitzvah to get married, we should be as flexible as possible. And that's why I guide, I've many times guided students or, or people that consult with me, go to this Rabbanut and not to this Rabbanut to register your marriage because they'll be more flexible about you know, getting married on Lag Bomer, the day after Lag Bomer, your Ashkenazi, your Sephardi, they many times they will not be flexible. Some Rabbani Yodah say, we're closed till Shavuot. Tire 49 days. We have to keep our customs. No, no, oh, no, so, no, okay, no, well, what's no, special no, about Lag Bomer? No, no, why people want to get married in Lag Bomer? Like, like, it's the first opportunity after the 33 days. You wanted to get no, married before Pesach. You wanted to get married already uh, before Pesach started, but you didn't manage to, so the next opportunity is Lag Bomer. So that's the earliest you can. <laughs> well, until Rosh Chodesh, you could, according to the Ashkenazi, some Ashkenazi customs. But according to the Sephardim, this is the first opportunity. Really, according to the Sephardim, it should be the 34th day. But uh, we're going to, uh, let's, let's speak about haircuts. Now, why is haircut such a big deal? I think uh, Amos asked that. Why is haircut such a big deal? Uh, so let's skip uh, to uh, number six on page 59. And then we, we promised Ariel to get to music, but we, we're not, he's not here yet. But, uh, um, let's do a deal with haircuts. Okay, number six. Uh, Amos, why don't you read it for us, please? The Rishonim write that one should not get a haircut during the Omer period. What does that mean, the Rishonim write? Who is the Rishonim? Yeah, ah, thank you, thank you. So happy. You're, you're getting used to it. Thousands of 1,500, very good. They're the commentators, the earliest commentators on the Talmud. Of course, there's the Gonim, but we'll leave that out for now. The Rishonim, right, this is the earliest idea where it says, right, what does it say in the Talmud? <coughs> that you're not, the, the customs of mourning that are mentioned are um, because the students died, the customs mentioned is... Um, it, it, was it mentioned earlier, this customs of, of the haircut? <coughs> it, it said that they died, but it didn't say specifically what the customs are. Um, so the first mention of actually haircutting sounds like it's in the Rishonim period. So, as I was saying to my student who was so upset that he forgot this is a later custom, idea of not getting haircuts. Even though we have to keep the customs, if it happened, don't feel so bad. That's when Rabbi Akiva's students uh, were, died, correct. So that, that, but the idea that specifically haircuts being prohibited, it, it, um, it's only mentioned that this is a particular festive type of activity. It comes from the times of the Rishonim, it seems like. We do have, we do have uh, hair cutting being prohibited whenever you're mourning. That goes back to the Talmud. But applying that particular mourning practice, like we said yesterday, not all of the mourning practices get translated from the period of national mourning, of Tisha B'Av and, the, right, and Shiva Sir Batamuz. That, that period of, of mourning, not all of those laws of mourning get transferred to the Omer. So some of them do and some don't. So which ones? So the Rishonim seems like it's the first time that they mentioned that haircutting is one of those festive activities that should be, should be curtailed during this period. Go ahead, Amos. As we learned about sections 3 and 4, Sephardim observed this prohibition until the morning of the 34th day of the Omer. Ashkenazi's custom, Ashkenazi custom on the other hand permits it from the morning of Lagba Omer and some are even more lenient permitting haircut on the night of Lagba Omer. In a time of need one may rely on those who rule leniently. See above number five. Only regular regular haircut which includes an element of joy are prohibited. However one may trim his Mustache, mustache. If it uh, interferes with his eating, <laughs> similarly, one who gets uh, 
Headaches. 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 <laughs> when his hair is too long, or one who has sores on his head may cut his hair during this period based on. Shulchan Aruch, Mishnah Brura, Biur Alacha, Sidur Pesach Kilchato, a few different places. Go ahead. Okay. If one has lies, or one's child has lies, then if there is no other way to get rid of them, a haircut is permissible. The prohibition applies to both men and women. Whoever, a woman, may cut their hair, hair up for purpose of modesty. For example, if her hair comes out of her head, covering, she may cut it. Uh, one may also cut or pluck hair for cosmetic purpose. Uh, therefore, women may pluck their eyebrows uh, or remove facial hair. You know, my, my daughter, uh, she's a professional uh, hairstylist. She, she does uh, brides. Tiferet, yeah. <coughs> Her company's called Tiferet Hair Art. So this is a very big problem during the Omer. If she can't give haircuts, people are not supposed to be getting haircuts. Fine. Up until Rosh Chodesh, Ashkenazim, some Ashkenazim are not yet practicing those morning practices. And after Lag Bomer, fine. But during, between Rosh Chodesh and Lag Bomer, those 18 days, she's out of work. You know what she did? No. Mm, close. She developed, actually. She's doing more and more, uh, she's doing more and more hair color. A lot of women color their hair. You're allowed to color your hair. Uh, that's not cutting, so. She, that's what she's actually teaching now. She's teaching a course. Uh, yes. So I have um, I have a lot of follicles in between my eyebrows. So okay. I get, very, I get a very prominent unibrow, but so it says I'm allowed to remove hair for, for sure. cosmetic purposes. Yes. So I can remove the unibrow during the uh, yeah summer. yeah that's right. It's not festive. So much things like this. Yes, to be careful. Right. Right. In any case, uh, the point is that uh, haircutting, and it's still today, when you get a haircut you feel good, it's a special festive type of uh, feeling, and that's what we're trying to avoid. And so if it's just, you know, uh, a touch up here and there, then that's, uh, you shouldn't go crazy. Okay, one may not. One may not cut children hair during this period unless there is a great need to do so, such as to prevent them from suffering. The main participants, participants in Brit Mila, the father of the child, the Sandak, and the Mohel may cut their hair in honor of the occasion. Wow. We will discuss the statue of Yom Hatzmaut below. According to Ashkenazi custom, one may cut his hair in anticipation of Rosh Chodesh, year when it falls out on Shabbat. Sephardim are lenient in this regard only under pressing circumstances. Those who follow the custom of Arizel take care not to cut their hair for the entire Omer period until Erev Shavuot, when they cut their hair in honor of festival. According to the custom of Arizel, one should not cut his hair uh, even for the sake of Brimila. The only expect exceptions is cutting the hair of three years old boys for the first time on Lakba Omer. Good, good. Okay, so haircutting, we think we got that covered. What about shaving? Is that the same halacha or different? Amos, you wanted to say something? For the Brit Milah, uh, that's. Uh, yeah, because Bezrat Hashem, I will be a grandfather. And oh, and very and exciting. When? Not, when? Yet, not, yet. not yet, not yet. Okay. But, and yes. that's some kind of, uh, it's kind of surprise me that. Only if you're the sandak, if you're the person that holds the baby when the, for the breed, then you have a special status. You will? Uh, yeah, yeah. Amazing, amazing. Okay, but you never know. It could be once a rabbi, it could be once a. Ah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe once, uh, you know. Uh, My son? Yeah, maybe he'll have. He Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> well then, I, I'm not going to touch that family uh, issues. Uh, but
But not always does the father get to, to be the sandak. Yeah. There maybe uh, your daughter in law has a father as well. <laughs> maybe there's a grandfather. Maybe there's there's many options of for who's going to be the son. Like, not always. Not always. Not always. <laughs> also, the fact that they might want to, somebody who's already finished Kiyor to be doing it. It's also an issue. Yeah, maybe you'll be question. finished by then. Maybe not. But uh, yeah, I think it's usually given to a Jew. But uh, in any case, I, I wouldn't. Uh, what are they? What's the expression? I would count my chickens before they're hatched. <laughs> First, let them have a healthy baby. That's the most important thing. And then, no, hatch. Hatch means to be born. No, no, no. No, 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 no. The egg shell gets hatched. Yeah, yeah. Hatched means to be born. Don't count the chickens before they they come out of their shell. So well, let's first have uh, your son should have a healthy baby, and that's really the most important thing. And working on then you're working on the brit milah. When I just had a student who had a brit milah, it was pushed off for almost a month because the baby had jaundice, yellow. You know, sometimes they push it off. So you never know. Could be by then you'll be Jewish already. Who knows? <laughs> Fully Jewish, right? Okay. Yes. My question was. Uh, if you the are the sandak the or the father of the Brit, then it's your holiday or the mohel, then you can cut your hair on that day. That's uh, your holiday. But if it's, your, you're just a guest, you don't, you don't you cut mentioned your hair. That's right. I didn't eat on Tanita Stair. That's right. I ate on, I ate on Tanita Stair. The, the Brit me love my son, yeah. In the Tanaras, there is like a wonder of service. They don't like the tiger clothes and they shave the hair. And Who are we talking about? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. Sorry. In a Tanakh. In, in Tanakh, Tanakh, Tanakh. In a Tanakh, yes, okay. Uh, so when something happens like a tragedy, they don't like the they tear their clothes. Yeah, sure. Clothes okay. and they, uh, shave the no, hands not necessarily. Just like ashes. No, so there's there's different customs. So first of all, tearing your your shirt, tearing your clothes, rending your shirt, your clothes, that's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah, uh, um, probably from the Torah when when somebody, one of your seven, the seven relatives, right? Brother, sister, father, mother, son, uh, or daughter, uh, or and wife or husband. So one of the seven relatives dies. You have to you have to rip your shirt, tear kriya. And there's specific laws about it. And there's rules. There's a bracha you make. There's a, that's that's uh, rending the garments. The Torah has prohibitions that you shouldn't mutilate yourself. This was a, an ancient custom. It's still in some countries. People do that. That they actually you know cut themselves as a sign that they're mourning. We don't do that. We don't cut themselves. And in terms of cut is shaving off your hair. No, the opposite. In, in our custom, uh, you let your hair grow. You don't. Uh, shaving is, is considered to be festive and, and uh, you know luxurious. Uh, uh, shaving off your hair, cutting your hair. No, no, we don't have such a custom. So, you, you know, there's certain. Uh, I should just mention in passing that uh, people make the mistake of of cutting off all their hair. You're not allowed to. According to uh, the Torah's laws, to cut off the corners of your hair, and also the corners of your be beard. That's right. Good. That's right. Very good. Very good. Very good. Right. That's right. That's right. And the normal, the other people, they are allowed to do the door, right? That's right. That's right. Yefe, yefe, good. Uh, there's some details about the Kohanim, but we'll, we'll leave that for another time. Shaving is really a more modern uh, type of uh, a daily thing. I mean, uh, a lot of beards around here. Maybe because of Sfirat Omer, maybe, maybe not. But um, in the Western world, it's quite common to shave every single day. And it's just part of the way you upkeep yourself. It's not the same thing necessarily as once a month or once every you know few weeks getting a, a haircut, which we said it can be a more festive uh, occasion. Uh, it's just a daily shaving. So some rabbis wanted to make that distinction and say, well, those laws of not uh, taking a haircut that doesn't apply to daily shaving. If people shave, you know, they, they feel 
They feel that it's uncomfortable after one or two days, the stubble comes, and you look bad. It's not, if that's, you know, in Western society, it's considered to be unkept. Unless you have a beard, that's something I else. But that's the title nowadays. I think oh, so. Many, many oh, it's yes, but, but it's one or the other. Either you have a beard, which is nice and fully developed, but that first period when you're, you know, if you're not grow, before it grows out, it grows in. It just looks like you're not taking care of yourself. It looks unkempt, and so uh, it could be embarrassing. It could be embarrassing. It could be bad for you at work. Uh, mm-hmm. People think that you're not taking care of yourself. It could yeah. could hurt to your your chances of of. Success at a business deal, you don't, if you're not uh, well cared for, groomed. So this has become an issue more in the modern times. As I said, in the ancient times, less people would be shaving every day. Of course, there, there, some people did, and the, uh, but, um, you know, the, and there's different ways of shaving. Again, one, we should mention in passing, you're not allowed to use a razor. We don't use a razor to shave. Uh, yeah, the, most posts can permit most types of electric shavers, although there's some, uh, that's a whole other deba- you know, discussion, which, which electric shavers are allowed, but most electric shavers use, uh, instead of a razor, it's a scissor-like action, because there's a, there's a, 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 a film, some kind of a, a net, and then the... the, the that's right, directly with the blade, directly on the skin, blade. exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So it's, it's a different. There's a different mechanism. Then we won't get the into the details. Well, the knife also works the neck. So not so much. Not so much. There's actually specific places in the beard which you're not allowed to cut off with a razor. And I mentioned the 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 sides of the head of the head. Even without a razor, you're not allowed to cut. And that's why I mentioned before you should be careful if you want to get uh, what's that called when you scalp your head? Total yeah. that type of ha- haircut. A ball is another problem. Yes, Hirsch, you want to? So from what I understand, uh, one cannot use the razor on the, the face and the peyote area, but the rest of the head and the neck... The, the neck and the back of the, the head, are, you're allowed to use a razor. Right, right, right. The top is the... The, the top, uh, also fine. Yeah, the razor is the problem for the, uh, for the beard. There's, there's five points. One, two here, two here, and then one here. But uh, again, that's, I'm mentioning in passing, if you do shave, you got to know how to shave in a kosher way. And then there's a question of, you know, when those, the side of the head, you're not allowed to take off uh, at all, even without a razor, even with scissors, the question is, okay, how far down does that go? That's the peot, that's the peot harosh, right? So uh, this area for sure, and uh, most posts can assume that you have to go down at least to parallel to the ear, so the, the Shulchan Aruch says the bottom of the ear. Does that include the earlobe? Not include the earlobe, but until here. So even even if you're not using a razor, but the the razor becomes a problem below this point here and here and here. But above this point, even if you're using scissors, you can't cut it to the skin to uh, totally cut off all your hair. That's considered to be the size of your head. So there's those are the laws of haircuts in general. Let's go back to the laws of the morning period and see how the morning plays out here. Yisrael, would it be uncomfortable for you to read because of the language or can you read for us out loud? Uh, let's try a little bit. Yeah. Let's try and see how it goes. Okay, go ahead. So page 16, number 7. Go ahead, Yisrael, you read. <coughs> uh, number 7. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A question, are we equating the issue of shaving during the Oma period? May you want to search the, the regularly regularly uh, to put out the year to show during this period. Many authorities <coughs> main, main, maintain that saving is uh, included in the prohibition of cutting one's hair. So when whether haircuts are prohibited, serving is prohibited as well. Most uh, yeshiva students follow this uh, practice to the point that we weren't refraining from serving has become the most. Po, 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 
side of the morning during the Oma period. Yeah, fair. Good. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, it's almost become like a social uh, marker that somebody who's a from Jew, religious Jew, you see the stubble during, during the uh, Omer period, and I've had some business meetings with uh, business-like people, but they all had their stubble, and it was the Omer period, and this is a marker of being you know, really religious. When you look into it, we're going to see... No, not at all. So we're going to see that some post scheme, however, uh, Micha, will you continue reading? Next, uh, next paragraph, 61 at the top. Some post scheme, however. Some post scheme, however, we think that there's a fundamental difference between Herkot and Shaykh. A Herkot is a special occasion that includes a joyous element. It is common that people give their Herkot in honor of holidays and celebratory events. In contrast, shaking is a routine practice nowadays, done daily or every few days, in order to remove anxiety, visitors, and so forth. Therefore, the custom to refrain from cutting one's hair does not apply to shaving. According to this opinion, it's especially appropriate to shave on Fridays to avoid breathing shuffle in a disrespectful manner. Those who want to rely on the Linian opinion may do so, and one should not rebuke them for this practice. However, it is proper for each person to follow the practice of his father. <clears throat> okay, stop there for a second. So there are many poski who say shaving is not the same as haircutting. You can shave during Sfirat Omer. Maybe wait one day till you feel uncomfortable and then it's cosmetic practice like we were talking about before, but it's not uh, anything festive about shaving. And so, uh, Hirsch, you've been around yeshiva people. They assume that of course you don't shave, just like you don't get haircuts. But not many poski said... Now nah, you're allowed to shave. Ramosha Feinstein has a tshuva where he says, you know, you're working in America. If you're a come unshaven, it looks bad. It's bad for business. And he, tell, he says it's allowed. Even Ramosha Feinstein, who's the leader of the religious uh, community in America, of uh, orthodoxy in America, <coughs> he says it's allowed. Those people who are in yeshiva, that's why they call it the yeshiva community, well, they're not going out and doing business. They're in their own little bubble. It doesn't hurt any, it doesn't hurt them. So they can, they can grow their hair and nobody will look, think twice. But if you're actually living, you know, working with, with normal people, it's going to look bad. And so you're actually, shaving is not prohibited during the Sphere of Tomer. And if, one second, one second. And if it becomes not prohibited, it might even become a mitzvah. When would it become a mitzvah? Before Shabbat. Before Shabbat. If you're going to be, you know, uh, make yourself all dressed up to go to a business meeting, why not get yourself all dressed up and pretty for Shabbat? So if it's not actually part of the customs of mourning, that's all the haircuts, which is, you know, a more festive thing. So then, and this Rav Soloveitchik also wrote that way, that he thinks it's a mitzvah to, to shave during the Sfirat Omer, at least on Erev Shabbat. This is, don't get confused with the laws of the three weeks during the morning period in the summertime, before, you know, between Shiva Sabbat Tammuz and, and uh, Tisha B'Av. We mentioned a number of times. There the rules are actually morning. We have real rules of morning. This is just some customs of festival, too much festivity we, we've limited. So some of the morning practices are transferred. And they say we're going to transfer them uh, in the equivalent way that's appropriate, and shaving does not include it. So some, if you see somebody shaving, don't think he's a, he's a goy. <laughs> don't think he's not being religious. Even uh, uh, many post uh, who want to be lenient, they say not only is it permitted, but it actually is the proper thing to do, at least on Erev Shabbat, to shave for Erev Shabbat. Yeah, questions before we continue? Uh, Moshe, yeah, you were waiting. Thank so, uh, regarding what you said with Rav, uh, it was Rav Moshe Feinstein who said that you mm. can shave here in the business world. Uh, I, as far as so, uh, the business world has changed now, you, uh, you can make an argument that that's, that that's changed because especially if you look at industries where most people are like, let's say, under the age of 40, uh, it's completely acceptable to have a beard now, even in a very formal way. Having a beard is not the same thing. Well, we talked about that before. What, if you have a beard, you have a beard. But not to be in between, the in-between stage even of just having a two-day stubble 
So if that, yeah, so nowadays we're a lot less formal and, you know, you come in jeans and, you know, right. So, I'm, of course, there's different, there's different uh, social circumstances. But uh, uh, the basic idea is not so much that, okay, it's such a big idea to, to make a, a leniency, this is a prohibition. It's not real. The, the essence of the matter is that shaving, if you shave every day, it's not festive. It's not like getting a haircut, which is once in a while. You get, you know, you shave every day. That's part of, you know, taking care of yourself. And so that's uh, that's the essence of the heter. And that applies even if you don't have to go to a business meeting. Even if you're not going to lose any money because the people at work will think you're you're just because that's your normal custom. You shave it, so th that should be allowed according to these posts that are lenient. Okay. But really, the bigger question is social. If you live in Kirat Moshe, if you live in a yeshiva community, this might be an example. Kirat Moshe is still a city, but if you live in Lakewood, and everybody's growing, you know, nobody's shaving, so you shouldn't shave either, right? You follow the custom. This is what gets what it gets complicated is when you have uh, somebody who's going to yeshiva in in the mirror yeshiva, right? And there nobody's shaving, but he comes home, and his father shaves. Well, you're supposed to keep the, the, the customs of your father. So you're going to look down on your father and you're going to say, oh, he's not religious. I'm not shaving, but he is shaving, so I'm more religious than him. So this is where it gets complicated because that's not allowed. You're not supposed to be you know, looking down on your father or, or thinking even that your father is less religious than you because he's doing something that's perfectly okay according to the halakha. If he's the tea, yeah, right. So that's, that's where it gets a little more complicated. Rav Rabinovich wrote very clearly, he said, that if you, if it, and then you're going to come to shul, and they see father's shaven, the son is not shaven. It doesn't, it doesn't fit. It's not right. And so Rav Rabinovich, for example, wrote that if it's going to look bad for your father or going to you know, make him, you know, people think that he's not being religious enough, so the son should shave as well just to make sure that he doesn't cause any disrespect to, to his father. That's a mitzvah doraita. Should you make your father feel uh, disrespected? That's a biblical command. This is a, a part of a custom which in some communities is practiced this way. Which one overrides the other, right? It's, it's obvious. So uh, it's, it's, uh, to, uh, to apply this, you have to have wisdom. You're always weighing different values. And when you come to the value of, of disrespecting your father, that could be a very big uh, consideration. Okay, Renan wants to speak, and Hirsch. I see. Uh, who comes first? Okay, Renan. Renan, go ahead. Uh, like to design the beard, like to go like a line here to go. Okay, that might be like a haircut. You're saying that's like more festive, or what? It's more like uh, decorative. If you do it every day, then that's that's a, a part of the leniency. Those the rabbis yeah, it makes sense. Like if it's I something you do, shape, uh, like is it something you do every day or once? No, 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 no. If it's like a haircut, then you shouldn't do it during I, the omer. Many, many right, right, okay, right. Well, well, it's good to to be part of the community that you're in. It depends on where you're living. I think it makes a big difference. Hirsch. What about the trimming? Uh, once, once a week, you uh, take a dip and like you would imagine a bush. You know how they do the topiary? Trimming, trimming, it's called. Yeah. Like on yeah. The side, right. The mustache, or right. Once a week during owner, what is the? Right. So, is that considered to be more like a haircut or more like shaving? So, I'd say it's more like a haircut. Um, it, uh, we mentioned that if it's you know if the mustache is bothering you, it's too long. That you can't it's bothering you with eating. You're allowed you're allowed to trim that that mustache when it's bothering you. But if it's not bothering you and it's just a question of you know looking good, so that sounds like it's a haircut. It's not like a daily practice. It's something you do to 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 pretty yourself up. You should wait those thirty three days. Okay, let's continue. Um, yeah. My question is. Because I can see here that they, the Paskin say that it's uh, the haircut is like uh, holidays, honor the holidays and celebration, celebrate events. I mean, as I see the Rishonim, they have been in 1,000, 1,500. Right. And they establish this as a, right. as a, as a 
something uh, which Custom, we yeah. learn through this not doing it. Right. But uh, for, for my, my experience, from my work where I'm coming, to haircut is nothing fancy, like nothing you enjoy. You know? It's like we, we used to have long hairs and stuff. Like that. Uh, I see. And, I, I see. mean, uh-huh. like in our culture, in today's days, I don't see it as a big problem to let the hair grow. You know, for, for myself, uh-huh. it's like no big right. deal. You know? Right. But uh, but then I am thinking about the idea of morning and kind of like what 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 will happen in the days <laughs> when it will be absolutely no issue for anyone or. I mean, this is the culture. My father he enjoyed to cut haircut when it was the celebration. He always do. He always went to get a haircut for a celebration, he, right? He knows that, but not right. me. I didn't learn from Interesting. him. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. How that? Yeah. How that? Then the system of the all the. Listen, uh, fashions come and go, uh, but the, yes. the human, the human uh, hygiene and human self care, yes. there's something uh, pretty basic about it that. Um, uh, in any case, it come, we come back to the idea of keeping traditions. Tradition is, this is the way we mark the morning. <clears throat> You're right, it's not, if there's any reason to be lenient, if you need to, you know, it's not the end of the world, like I was telling my student who's feeling so bad that he forgot. It's okay, it's not the end of the world. If you, but uh, the first, the chathila, Right? The ideal situation is that we keep the practices, we keep the customs, and so we don't get a haircut for these 33 days. If you, uh, if you have an extenuating circumstances, there's plenty of room to be lenient from here or there. But, uh, um, and you're right, because socially, culturally, it can change you know, how the attitude to haircuts. Um, but this is something of uh, keeping our traditions. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's speak about music. Music, music, we've been waiting for so long. <laughs> Really, it's not prohibited. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to be happy with this one. Rab Melamed is actually quite lenient on this issue. And the reason why is because, as we said, the, the, the idea to have a period where we're mourning is very ancient, from the Talmud, right? 20 students of Rabbi Kiva. But exactly how that plays out, which customs of mourning, so we said haircuts, it's not mentioned in the Talmud. What about music? It's not really mentioned in the Talmud either. What is mentioned is dancing musical instruments. No. Weddings. Exactly. What is, what what is, is mentioned is weddings. 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 weddings is considered to be the, almost the opposite of 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 uh, mourning, right? Everybody knows a mourner doesn't go to go, go to weddings, right? So it's the, it's the total opposite. So weddings and haircuts. That's the original, the the earliest customs that we have. Now weddings turned into well, okay. Weddings includes dancing and live music. And that's what we say. Even if you're not, of course, separate dancing. Even if you're not at a wedding, you shouldn't listen to to live music. Live music, well, what happened to uh, electronic devices? Now we already have, in the day, you can imagine, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a party. And it was a very fancy home. And they had... A violinist, a live violinist walking around in someone's home. As one does. <laughs> so I've never been to a party like that in someone's home where they have a live, actually, uh, it's not true. If it's a wedding celebration, I actually have brought in live musicians and they played. But that's, that's you can imagine that having someone, a musician, play live music, that's very festive. It's almost like a wedding, right? But nowadays, you know, you come home, you push play, or you don't even come home, you have on your phone, you push play, you put it in your earphones. We all have music all around us all the time. Like you could say, like, if we well, on demand music, if, if you include like Edison, still, like, you've had for like 120 that's years. That's right, since so, the, the, the record players, right? The patiphone, yeah. the, the patiphone, right? Yeah. It's, it's, but that's new. 100, what's 100 years? We're talking about uh, thousands of years of Jewish tradition. Is that included in don't have weddings? Is that include, this live music? Is this considered to be live music? So this is what uh, we've been dealing with for a hundred years. And most poskim are machmir, but it's a big chumrah. It's a very, uh, uh, in my, in my uh, understanding, it's really a chumrah upon a chumrah upon a chumrah. That the original custom is haircuts and weddings. Weddings turned into live music, live music, uh, dancing, dancing turned into any live music, even if you're not dancing, and then 
uh, live music turned into recorded music, and then recorded music turned in, even into your earphones. Some people, they even turn off their, their ringer on their phone. They, 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 instead of having music, they have a beep, 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 beep. That's a real, you're, you're really extending this prohibition well, really extremely. So let's see how Rabbi Malamed discusses this, and then we'll, uh, you know, okay. we'll see how, how, to, how to practice. Yes? It was funny, like, last week I went to my family, right, where I like to clean. And it was funny, Mr. Paul Vaughan was very happy. So I was like, yeah, I'm so glad I found my CDs, and they're all a cappella, so I can still listen to them for the old man. That's <laughs> right. Some people, they say we're going to listen to music without musical instruments, yes. a cappella. Right. The radio stations. You can turn on the radio here in Israel. They only play a cappella music. The truth is, there's more room for that in the summer, during the real period of mourning, right before Tisha B'Av. That makes more sense. Music is, is uh, you know, that's... But this is just some customs of mourning. We're not supposed to take all of the customs of mourning and apply them during this 49 days or 33 days. Uh, finish, yeah. <coughs> also, does it make a difference if the music is sad or happy or dancing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember when I was a Kleine Hidushiken going to day school. Yes. They told us you can't watch television. Oh, when I grew up, you were allowed to watch television, but you weren't allowed to go to movies. Assuming you go to movies the rest of the year. But going to a movie, now you can imagine, we talked about the culture. There's something very festive about going out to the theater, right? So nowadays the theater has turned into movies. It's a little less festive, especially, you know, the big movie theaters have now become a small room with a small screen, and right, there's uh, 10 different movies playing at the same time. But in the day, going to the movies was a festive event, right? So you can imagine that uh, it's cultural, cultural. Um, you go to the movie uh, theater today, cinema, cinema, you have, what do we have here called Cinema City? There's 10 movies. Yeah. At the same, you get to choose. In the building, there's 10 different uh, halls. It's not like, you know, in the, in the ancient time, you would go to a movie. You'd go to, like, to, to a, a theater. A, a, also, some places you actually have, because you have so, you want, they want to show so many movies at once, each one, they only have like 10 or 20 people in. There's 20 yeah, seats. So yeah. Small. yeah, so small. Yeah. Those are like the indie films. There are. There are all kinds. There are all kinds. Not that I'm suggesting anybody go to movies. Don't, don't uh, misunderstand. What but movies? Moshe, you're saying, what is a movie? Exactly. Not, why waste your time? You should be learning Torah. Be learning Torah. And definitely many movies have bad things uh, about... Uh, uh, but there's, there might be some mixed dancing in some of the movies, so you got to be careful with movies. But leaving that uh, that issue out, you're right, Moshe. It gets extended to you know this. What what is actually prohibited? Let's read it inside and try to finish up about music at least, and we'll leave. Uh, okay, so we're in page 63. <coughs> Who, who's going to read? David. Uh, David, go ahead. Dancing and music. Since it is customary not to celebrate too much during the Oman period, the Acharonim write that one may not engage in optional dancing. Dancing that is not for the sake of a mitzvah. Right, somebody asked me the other day, we danced at uh, Kiddush Lavana. Ah, yes. Yeah. You asked me, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how can we do that? Well, that's, that's a mitzvah, that's something else. Anyways, but go ahead. Shabbat also, some people dance, sure, yeah. They also forbid playing or listening to musical instruments. According to Sephardic custom, the laws of mourning last until the morning of the 34th day of the Omer. Nevertheless, in honor of the Ilulam, the outside anniversary of the death of the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, music and dancing are permitted to start the Omer. Afterwards, however, the prohibition resumes and continues through the night of the 34th until the next morning, when all customs of mourning cease to apply. This is just a review of what we said before, that, you know, the Sephardic custom and Ashkenazi custom. Go ahead. According to Ashkenazi practice, the prohibition lasts until the end of the 32nd night, the day of the owner. 
meaning that music, dancing, and the rejoicing are permitted from the beginning of the night of Bagdo over in honor of the Hindula of Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. Most Ashkenazim refrain from large celebrations, like festive graduations, ceremonies, or dance nights, until Shavuot. But one may play and listen to music instruments. Music instruments. One may conduct exercise classes with musical accompaniment, 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 even before the Quran. But ideally, the volume of the music should be lowered so that it is clear that the purpose of the music is to facilitate exercise, not to bring the joy. It is customary to permit dancing and playing music on Hol Amor et Pesach, because it is a mitzvah to be joyful there. Weddings, however, may not be held on Hol Amor et because we do not mix one celebration with another. The sages also forbid getting a haircut on Hol Amor et so that people do not prior to the so that people do so prior to the festival. A Jew who makes a living playing music may perform on non-Jewish affairs if he needs to need the income. One may also teach or study music during the honor period, since these endeavors are not joyful. Um, however, a music student who in any event studies only intermittently throughout the year should schedule a break if possible during the morning period of the honor. If he intends to take only one break a year, it is preferable that, uh, that it be during the three years. So uh, he mentioned briefly the idea of uh, exercise. Exercise classes, of course, is a group of people together. But many times when we listen to music nowadays, it's not the same as having the violin player come and play in front of you. It's uh, very festive. It's just while I'm doing my work, while I'm washing the dishes, while I'm cleaning the house, I, I listen to music that makes the time pass, uh, make calms my nerves. That's sort of like secondhand. I'm not sitting there listening to music. I'm doing a different activity, the, the background accompaniment, you know, uh, oftentimes, uh, yeah, this is quite common. How do we deal with that? So Rabbi Muhammad, skip the next section and go to page 66. And he has uh, his approach to uh, listening music on electronic devices. Uh, and this is where I said he was, he was quite lenient. Okay? Um, Moshe, Moshe, back to you. Number 10, listening to music on electronic devices. Many posts can maintain that there is no difference between <coughs> listening to live music and listening to music on the radio or any other electronic device. Both are forbidden during the Omer period, until long Omer, and the three weeks. One may, however, listen to non-instrumental music on an electronic device. Some forbid even this, because, this, because the device itself is considered a musical instrument. However, some maintain that the prohibition on music does not apply to listening to music on the radio or any other personal electronic device, as listening to music this way is not festive, whereas live music is. Furthermore, nowadays, listening to music on electronic devices is a regular, universal practice, and so, since it has become so routine, it is no longer considered a source of joy and festivity. Thus, listening to it is like listening to singing without musical accompaniment, which is permitted during the Omer period. In addition, a distinction should be made between joyous songs and regular songs. Only joyous songs should be forbidden to listen to during the Omer, but regular tunes and certain sad tunes should not be prohibited during the morning period of the Omer. Therefore, one of which needs to be lenient may rely on this opinion and listen to regular and sad songs on a personal electronic device. However, he should not play this music loudly because the power of the sound that fills the room generates a festive atmosphere. It seems that according to all views, a driver who is worried that he might fall asleep at the wheel may listen to music in order to keep himself alert. Okay, so as you can see, he's quite lenient. He says, listening to music on a device is not the same, it's not live, it's not festive, you're not going to dance, and it does make a difference whether it's sad songs or happy songs. Or, right? The point is, don't make a party. A party is like a wedding, and this is not the time for parties. Okay, but if it's not a party, you're just listening to music to calm down, to relax, there's really no prohibition. Many post have said that, but if you're not going to, uh, uh, not if it's not going to lead to mixed dancing, if it's not going to lead to dancing at all, it's just 
you're allowed to enjoy yourself. There's nothing, it's not really, as I go back to the original idea, this period of the Omer is not essentially a period of sadness. Yeah, it's so important to understand, like, where the cost from the marriage, uh, provision of the... From marriage, from, from, from marriage, marriage. Right, right, right. It's an extension from marriage. But really, it is a happy period. It's a period of growth. It's a period of, perhaps there is trepidation. There is, there is things to worry about, but it shouldn't be totally over, overtaken by this some customs of mourning, of haircuts and weddings. Let's keep it at haircuts and weddings. And um, uh, you know, when it, nowadays we listen to music, it's a totally different uh, situation, uh, reality. It's not like in the olden days when listening to music was, you would have, you would have to bring someone in to play an instrument for you, or play having having a live live. I understand that that could be a little bit more festive, but uh, nowadays you just play it on your phone or play it, uh, you know, uh, at home. There's there's a, a quite cogent argument to be lenient about listening to music during the Omer period when you're by yourself or in your earphones or but, you know, when you're with a group. I would limit it. Uh, you know, you don't want it to lead to uh, a party-like atmosphere. But anything that's not a party-like atmosphere, I believe it's allowed. Okay, let's um, let's continue, um, and I want to move ahead to chapter five. Chapter five is relating to Amos's question: What is this whole Lag Bomer thing? We have what, about a week? A week left? Sorry. Yeah, we skipped it. We skipped it. Uh, if you have a particular event like that, you can relate to it. The question is, can you have music at such an event? Right? The kid's bar mitzvah. It's his birthday. It's his 13th birthday. So he's got to celebrate. It's, it's great. But are you allowed to have music or not? The custom is um, primarily that if it's a sudat mitzvah, you can. Any people are machmir, but <coughs> essentially, that's allowed. And uh, to make a, a mitzvah, it's very, you know, like I said, a bar mitzvah boy, uh, that's a, no greater celebration. He's obligated in mitzvot. Some people make a siyum. You've heard this idea? Did you complete a course of Torah study? We spoke about it. Erev Pesach, uh, there was such a, a siyum. And uh, that was a special type of fast day that would, could be pushed off by a siyum. Most other fast days are not like that. But... Okay, Lag Bomer. Lag Bomer is coming up. We've got a month, a, a week, excuse me, a week and a bit till Lag Bomer. Where does this whole come from, this whole idea? I mentioned earlier that it comes from this calculation of two weeks, two weeks um, before Atzeret. Um, and that, that's when the students stopped dying. But let's see what Rav Lama has to say. Okay, um, who's going to read now? Hirsch, please. Page 103, chapter 5. Chapter 5, Lagba Omer. Lagba Omer. It is customary to rejoice someone on Lagba Omer, even though we observe some customs of mourning during the Omer period. Nevertheless, one may sing and dance on Lagba Omer. The Hanum in the society neither on Lagba Omer nor at Minha in the preceding one must not fast on Lagba Omer. By the way, um, we mentioned last week that those who celebrate Yom Ha'atzmaut, they say, well, if we're celebrating, if we're making a holiday, then it overrides the rules of the morning. Just like Lag Baomer. Lag Baomer, there's no real precedent for Lag Baomer as, as a biblical or rabbinic holiday, but it's the custom that we are festive. So no less should be Yom Ha'atzmaut. If you are going to celebrate Yom Ha'atzmaut, it overrides the customs of the morning, and we sing and dance as we did last week on Yom Ha'atzmaut. And, yeah. the, and those who are not so very Yom Ha'atzmaut, they suffer more. Right, for them it's a regular day as part of the Omer, but uh, you know. And the reason we rejoice on Lagba Omer is that the original meeting had, had the tradition that the students of Rabbi Akiva stopped dying on the 33rd day of the Omer. The year, Yabamot, 62b, to some explain that the students actually continue dying on the 33rd day of the Omer, that Akiva is again teaching the students, including Ash Shimon Bar Yochai, who did not die in the plague, and through them, Torah spread among the Jewish people. This is why we were just on the Omer, pre Hadash, 492. Others claim that on the 33rd day of the Omer, that Akiva conferred rabbinical elimination on his five students. That was the year, 
רבי. אה, which we just learned yeah This actually, uh, this continues what we discussed the other day about the Omer period being a period of growth, spiritual growth. We have seven times seven. Remember the, uh, that, and the, the hair, the growing of the hair has significance according to the Kabbalistic uh, practices. The, hair, the growing hair represents some certain uh, sort of like pipelines of holiness. And, uh, and, the and you don't want to be cutting those, maybe never, but specifically not during the period when you're practicing, when you're focusing on the, the spiritual growth of the Omer period. So if you are Kabbalist, you don't touch your Correct. If you're not Kabbalist, you have to know the Correct. That's right. That's right. That's right. I was told, I heard from a friend that the hair growth represents din, and the beard growth represents chesed. So that is why, like, some people they don't even touch really. Don't ever. Touch beard, ever. Right. Right. Uh, shave their uh, head hair regularly, short, just to minimize the din mm. uh, part of Hashem's uh, ruling over over them. Or, like, right. Them. Right. Chesed uh, increase chesed. Right. But I hear. Absolutely, yeah. There are so many, so many traditions, so many customs. If you try to keep all of them, you'll go crazy. Literally. You have to know what's... And, and also, you, fine, you want to sh shave your hair uh, short because you don't want to have deen. But there's a mitzvah in the Torah that you're not allowed to shave too close. Right? Well, that's what we were speaking about before. You've got to be careful not to, to shave off your peot. And so uh, you've got to know what you're doing. Pull that around and say, well, yes, that, that's good because you know you have to have some din. It has to be, it has to be some din because we're not perfect. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yafa, yafa. Din is is a harsh justice. Harsh, uh, uh, right? Our all of our lives have a mix of uh, grace and love, and sometimes uh, a harsher, a stricter. Uh, aspects to it. So, good point. Okay, fine. Uh, so far, so good. This was a nice review for us of the laws. What is it all about? What is this Hilula Rav Shimurachai? We mentioned that this is the day of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, maybe he ordained his students, the five students which, after the 24,000 died, those five became the foundation of all of Torah for the rest of our Jewish history. So it's very a big day of, of studying Torah, but then we get into one of those five students, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who is associated with the Zohar, the world of the, the, the mysticism, uh, the mystic strain in Judaism, associated with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. You could say this is a party to celebrate the hidden parts of Torah the more mystical uh, aspects and interpretations of Torah, the headquarters, Rosh Hashanah, for this part of Judaism, is on Lag Omer. We're going to see it inside. Yeah. Okay, this might be a stupid question. So far, it's written in Hebrew, not Aramaic. Actually, it's mostly Aramaic. Oh, it's mostly Aramaic. Okay. Mostly so, Aramaic. That's what, so that's why he's referred to as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, not Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai. 
It's, a, it's an interesting question. Why? Who gets called Ben and who gets called okay, Bar? They use both. Yeah. Whether, whether someone was primarily, whether someone did their works primarily in Aramaic, mm. they would have signed their name something Ben, a uh, Bar something. But if they did the work mostly in Hebrew, they would have signed their name something Ben something. Interesting theory. I'm not sure it's true. Uh, it's fascinating. Rosh Hashim is well known for being. The, the father, you could call it the godfather, of, of the Zohar and the, the mystical side of Judaism. You cannot forget, Rav Shimon Bar Yochai was one of the five students of Rabbi Kiva. The Shas, at the Mishnayot, are full of his Torah teachings on the revealed parts of Torah. The laws of Shabbat and Kashrut and everything and the prayers. Rabbi Shimon was a major, major Tana, the continuer of Rabbi Akiva, in all areas of Torah, not only the hidden. So we shouldn't think that it's only... Now, what, we're talking about the period of the sages. We're going to talk more about it, but the, the lingua franca was, was Hebrew, but there was also Aramaic there. There was a Palestinian Aramaic that was speaking there. It was Palestinians. They knew, <laughs> they, they, they knew how to speak Aramaic, the Palestinians in those days. So the Palestinian Aramaic, it existed side by side, but the Mishnah is totally written in Hebrew. Although they were, there were people speaking Aramaic as well. The Talmud in the land of Israel is more in Aramaic than in Hebrew. So they're both languages. It's hard to know exactly who uses bar and when we use ben. But you're right, bar. So what, is, what does it mean to be bar mitzvah? And bar kofa, right? What does it mean to be bar mitzvah? Essentially, it's the same word as ben mitzvah. Ben mitzvah means that you are... It is the same word, just one's in Aramaic, one's in Hebrew. Correct, correct. Uh, it means to be to be bend something. It means that you are uh, viable. You're you're uh, it's applicable to you. You you have the mitzvahs devolve upon you when you become bar mitzvah. You become obligated in the mitzvot. So uh, right right you chayav mitzvot. So so we're gonna have to continue. Bezer the Shem talk about the the meaning and the messages behind Lag Baomer. Maybe tomorrow, maybe we're gonna push it off till next week because we do have a few days before Lag Baomer next week. Now that we've done the halachic part of it, um, uh, maybe we'll uh, discuss, we're gonna be discussing Lag Baomer, but um, I wanna maybe we'll fill in what happened in the second temple period before we and then get to the sages and then we'll be able to talk about the Zohar and the mystical sides of Judaism over the coming week. Be'ezrat Hashem. Okay? Yes. Yes. Part of oral Torah, correct. Uh, part, uh, 